ostentatious, almost vulgar. Apparently in Italian it's called saponetta, like a little bar of soap. It's got such an aggressive look to it. It just looks somehow the future of motoring. The only stand apart really is the bonnet. It's like driving a little tank. This is the one for me. The story of BMW starts in the 1910s, before the First World War, when a company was set up in Munich to build aircraft engines, military aircraft engines. In the late 1920s, Germany, of course, was still banned from uh, indulging in this sort of activity. BMW looked round and bought into a car company in Eisenach, in another part of Germany, which was already building cars called Dixies. Dixies were small, cheap and cheerful little cars, which were actually lightly modified Austin 7s from Britain. BMW had great ambitions. It didn't take them long to decide to modify this car much further and to put in the BMW design of engine that then became the staple of the 1930s product. Throughout all this period, BMW was very careful to maintain its identity. Right from the word go, the badge had been the blue and white spinner, an artistic impression of a rotating propeller, which is to tell us that BMW started by making aero engines. And incidentally, BMW, in English it means quite simply, Bavarian Motor Works. In a period of not more than three or four years, a whole sequence of 300 series models appeared. The most important car technically was the 328 sports car, because here was a smart, smooth, two-litre, two-seater machine with a very advanced engine. Well, this is a 1938 BMW 328, imported into this country in early 39 by Fraser Nash. It is a pure BMW. The only Fraser Nash input was, in fact, to put their own badges on it and then sell the car in this country under their name because Fraser and Ash were a, a very noted manufacturer of bespoke sports cars from the late 20s through into the 30s, until all of a sudden in 1935, this strange little manufacturer from Bavaria came along called BMW and suddenly started beating them at their own game. Uh, they rapidly concluded that they could never compete with it, and the sensible thing to do was to take the agency. Traditional Fraser Nash owners switched across to the BMW product because it was such a huge leap forward in all engineering terms of motor car. And the pièce de résistance, certainly as far as the 3 to 8 was concerned, was a really brilliant piece of engine work that produced a hemispherical head engine that develops a lot of power, very deep breathing engine, really an awfully long way ahead of its day. I think one of the main attractions of the 328 was that it looked very different from the average mid-1930s sports car. 1930s MG, for instance. Very square rig, upright front radiator grille, separate headlamps. Suddenly, here comes the 328, flowing front wings, smooth and rounded front end. It just looked somehow the future of motoring. I can remember sitting in my push chair when my father was fettling his motor cars. Uh, he was a Riley man and we had lots of space around us at home and father had the good sense to give me the remains of a motor car when I was nine, which got me out of his workshop. So that I went away and learned about nuts and bolts somewhere else and didn't confuse his cars. And I bought my first three to eight in 1968. This is the one for me. I, I, I have no cause to change at all. Uh, this motor car does absolutely everything I want with it. If I want to compete a bit, I can compete. If I want to cane it across Europe, it'll do it, and it'll do it at uh, speeds that nowadays one mustn't talk about. And I see no cause to have to change. By the late 1930s, the whole idea of motorsport supremacy in Germany was all important. They entered specially streamlined 328s 
for an event in Italy called the Milimilia in 1940, which was a year after World War II started. And one of those cars driven by Hutschke von Hanstein won the event very convincingly indeed. When World War II broke out, BMW, with three major factories, was making cars in one of them, motorcycles in one of them, and aero engines in the biggest factory of all in Munich. Naturally, those factories then received the attention of the RAF and the United States Air Force. An even bigger problem was that the factory which had built cars in the 30s, Eisenach, found itself behind the Iron Curtain. And suddenly BMW not only had ruined factories, but no car-making expertise on the West German side of the border either. And in fact, they couldn't start making motor cars again for six or seven years after the war. There were so many huge shortages in Germany that they couldn't announce a new motor car until 1951, when the original post-war 500 series car was shown. Behind the launch of that car was a new family of V8 engines. BMW obviously had ambitions to move up market. All over the world you will meet the white and blue BMW crest. For BMW means elegant styling, silent running, proverbial dependability. My car is uh, a 1957 BMW 507. It actually came to me after I'd tested one of the works cars at the Hockenheim uh, racing circuit where I'd been riding in the Grand Prix. And I'd seen this car, which uh, von Falkenhausen, the chief engineer of BMW had, and uh, he saw me looking at it, so he said, take it for a run. So uh, I took it for a run and thought, this is rather nice. I, I, I can imagine myself whisking over the continent between Grand Prix in something like this. So I thought, well, how do I pay for it? That's the next thing. Well, Augusta, Count Augusta, who I rode for, had suggested that he ought to get me a present because I'd won him his first 500cc motorcycle championship the previous year. And so I thought, well, dare I ask for a 507 BMW? Well, I did. And uh, he did, in fact, contribute the majority of the uh, payment for it, which worked out about £2,700. When I actually got my car, I was frankly disappointed because it didn't match up to the one I tested. But uh, I went back to the experimental department and twisted their arm, and I became a sort of the experimental uh, driver, i.e. they tested a few things on my car and they uprated the engine. In those days, of course, there wasn't that much traffic on the road. You used to be able to go along and 120s or 130 even wasn't dangerous. Uh, you didn't come across too many traffic jams and I used to I think average 70 mile hour door to door from Milan to Bromley uh, with no trouble at all and no hassle and I think about 22 miles to the gallon. So, no, it, it was, um, it served me very well. Okay, it wasn't a racing car type performance uh, from it, but it was a, a car which gave you a good message. And this is an important thing, you need to relate to a piece of machinery. I, you could go along and it would adjust itself to suit you. And that's what appealed. It was a very attractive looking car, but it wasn't fleet enough, it wasn't nimble enough to catch the attention of sports car buyers. So it only sold in hundreds rather than in thousands. And I think at this point we can say BMW began to stumble. 
they decided to make smaller, cheaper motor cars in bigger numbers. As a complete change from the 500 series, took out a license to build bubble cars, this was the Isetta. They were small, they were fine, and they sold in big numbers, but they weren't making money. After the war, they were struggling to find an image. This is shown most graphically in a range brochure of the mid-50s, which has a motorbike, a bubble car, the large prestige diplomatic cars, and finishes up with the exotic 507. And they weren't really sure which of these cars they were marketing most strongly. The crunch for BMW came in about 1959, when the company came perilously close to being closed down. In came some serious investors. Gentlemen, they said, you must start making middle-sized, smart, middle-class motor cars. And in 1961, a completely new generation of BMW was born. It established BMW in the company that we now know in the late 1990s. Once the BMW 1600 went on sale in the early 1960s, this signalled the birth of the modern BMW company. The motor car was very carefully thought out. A technically modern car for the middle classes, distinctive style, a very modern engine and a very modern chassis and suspension underneath. Everything that BMW tried to prove with that car has been carried on with other models ever since. The German economic miracle was well and truly in place. BMW were exporting tens of thousands of cars all over the world, into Britain and into North America in particular. The story might have gone sour when the Americans began to introduce lots and lots of restrictions on exhaust emissions. BMW were up to that. They installed a large engine, the 2000 engine, in the small body, called it the 2002. I've always wanted a 2002. Um, I used to have a bicycle and cycle into uh, college, into the library, and every morning I used to see this 2002 parked in the library car park and I used to cycle a couple of times around it and think, wow, when I'm rich, I'll get one of those. So um, I actually wanted to find the person who owned it because I thought there was this wonderful man that probably uh, I'd fall madly in love with. I never met him. I'd had a series of company cars and used other people's cars and different things and I've never really bought a car of my own. So I thought, yep, hit the big 3 got to get, got to be my own woman, got to get a car that I love. I bought it because of the shape of it. Apparently in Italian it's called saponetta, like a little bar of soap. And if you think about uh, a child when they draw a car and it's very sort of like that, it's a very simple shape. And when I first got it, I couldn't believe that I'd got it, and I kept on looking out of the window. And in fact, I, I woke up in the middle of the night several times and looked out, just to sort of look at it, at the shape of it, and thought, wow, it's all mine, brilliant. In the 60s and 70s, BMW were much clearer about their image. Like the other German car Mercedes-Benz, they were very keen on presenting technical excellence, solidity and safety. But unlike Mercedes-Benz, they wanted to present glamour, they wanted to present speed and style. You're much more likely in their brochures to see cars in exotic locations, cars photographed for their own sake, whereas in a Mercedes brochure you'll always see them photographed to show the car technically. The clothes that I buy or things that I have, I like very simple design, quite sleek design. I don't like patterns and, I, and that's why I like the car really, because it's, it's quite sleek, it's not ostentatious, um, it's quite simple. Put anything else on and it looks cluttered, take anything away and it, it would be missing something. There's a little bit of chrome but not too much. Um, and it just, it's just quite solid, everything about it is solid, it's quite reliable, 
Um, there's no messing around sort of car. It's like driving a little tank. <laughs> Quite like that. <laughs> So I like I like the design of it from the outside when I first set about buying it. But then now I've, I'm sort of inside it and using it. There are lots of things inside that I really like as well. I like the horns. There are four horns, and they're all on the little arches around the steering wheel, which is brilliant. And I like the little quarter lights in the windows because you can open those, and it's just like having air conditioning. The sound of the indicators is wonderful. It's very soothing, it's very gentle, it's um, very sort of low, and uh, it's also got a hazard warning light as well, which is, it just, you think, oh, it's going to stop, but it just sort of ticks through to the next one. I also like on the um, petrol cap, there's a little tiny, tiny little cover over where, and it's on a spring-loaded cover where you put the key in, and it's just really dinky, and every time I fill up with petrol, I really like just moving it. One particular day, this very beautiful black man in a double-breasted suit, as I was waiting at the traffic lights, walked in front of me, stroked the bonnet and mouthed, very nice car, lady. <laughs> so I'd fluttered my eyelids and waved and drove on, which I thought was quite nice. I was supposed to go from 0 to 60 in about 10 or 11 seconds. Um, I don't think I've ever tried doing that, but, and I wouldn't let anyone try to do it anyway, but uh, you know, there is quite a lot of power in the engine. The 2002 people that I've spoken to on the phone kind of describe themselves as quite laid back, baggy jumpers, beards, you know, kind of take life as it comes sort of people. Enjoy life, they enjoy their cars, they're proud of their cars, but it's not, you know, it's not this sort of status thing. And a lot of the BM drivers, you know, they're kind of into all this badge society, whatever, and I think you can buy an M3 sticker as well, you know, pretend that you've got a car that's hand-built. It's all a bit sad and they're all kind of company boys. So I'd like to go to a car rally and to see that in action. Uh, so all the two, 2002 sort of in the corner, everyone enjoying themselves and the rest of the BM Owners Club, you know, kind of out there showing, it, showing off. By the mid-1970s, the smallest BMWs were three series. The middle-sized BMWs were five series. The large BMW was the seven series and there was usually a coupe line as well. They were now covering a sporting market from 1.6 litres all the way up to 3 or 4 litres. And they said if we grab him when he's 30, we'll keep him till he's 65. They've always been interested in motorsport, but towards the middle of the 1980s, it became clear that Production car racing in particular was becoming very important for publicity. A new category called Group A was being introduced and BMW said we have to get involved in this. Not just to turn up but to win in Group A racing. The result was the M3. The M3 arrived in 1986, immediately became a successful production saloon car. Fortunately for everyone, particularly the enthusiasts, in the next few years, there was a running battle between BMW and Ford with the Sierra Cosworth. Each of the companies had its own particular trumpet to blow. BMW said, well, of course, we're winning races with a motor car that doesn't need turbocharging. And the M3 was just a superbly developed, normally aspirated motor car that could win production car racing all around the world. This is a BMW M3. Uh, it's a 16 valve, 2.3 litre twin cam. It's made in left hand drive only and was initially built as for the purpose of racing. Although uh, to get homologated for racing, so many road cars had to be made. This is it's quite a lot different from the standard body. Body 3 series, the roof's different, the wings are different, the door's different. The only standard part really is the bonnet. This is the first of the M3s, there's other editions of it. 
It's got such an aggressive look to it. It's boxed arches, um, and the engine is it's just got a phenomenal engine in it. Such a small engine for the amount of power it puts out. In the late 80s, the yuppies were clearly a target market for the BMW M3. The brochures to feed this market were gigantic, ostentatious, almost vulgar. They were full of glamorous pictures, rich colours and text that reflected the racing pedigree. The whole purpose of these brochures was to impress and to seduce the reader into buying an M3 BMW rather than an, a, another equally ostentatious car. I'd seen the car advertised in a magazine, decided that now was the time to have one, the prices were coming right, packed the wife and kids in the car and shot off down to Weymouth. Um, looked at the car and I decided straight away that, that I was going to have it. Went out for a test drive and the guy Mike, who uh, had come out of the army, was basically trying to find out what I knew about BMs. Unbeknown to me, while I was out, the wife was being grilled on how well I looked after my cars. And then they decided that I was to be the suitable owner and that they would bring it up and deliver it to me. Um, I think I was absolutely gutted that they were having to let it go. And then he's asked for for me to sell it back to him if I decide to sell it, which at the moment is very unlikely. <laughs> My daughter's uh, well, two, two and a half now, and uh, she's into BMs as well. She's got her own little BMW pedal car, um, and can actually pick out my M3 in a crowd of crowd of cars, which is quite amazing, really. And even those mummy's 318i. So uh, she's a bit of a BMW fan herself as well. There's some nice cars on the market, but the BMW Mark to me, is, they've just got it right. Everything's right cars made for a purpose, and they do their job, really. BMW is convinced that it's won the battle for the sporting image. It has a complete range of cars. It has added a sports car, the Z3 sports car, of course. They have a totally consistent Teutonic reliable image. It's a wonderful image that the rest of the world wishes it could mine and use for its own purposes. But if you or I went out to buy a BMW today, we're buying an image, we're buying performance, and more than that, we're buying the ability to say to the world, look at me, I've arrived. <laughs>